Hi, I'm David. I'm an architect at a company called Couchbase. We make a document database. It's a very cool document database. You should check it out, but that's not what I'm actually going to be talking about today here. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, graph databases and what you do with them, how they work, uh, why would you consider using one, why you wouldn't consider using one, and uh, just generally uh, try and get everyone familiar with this whole world of weird niche databases which are really fun and very cool. Um, so before we start talking about graph databases, let's talk about graphs. I should have removed the title. I was going to ask, anyone know who this guy is? But then the answer is right there, so that wouldn't have worked. Um, should have asked anyway and still look at how many confused people didn't actually read the slide. Uh, but anyway, this is Len uh, Leonard Euler, which if you've studied uh, math or computer science, you probably know uh, who he is. He's a uh, very famous mathematician. And he wrote the very first graph theory paper uh, in 1736 on a well-known problem called the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. Who knows where Konigsberg is today? Russia. Just, it's Russia. It's Kaliningrad in Russia. Nice. Well done. Usually when I ask it, like, in the U.S., no one even knows what Konigsberg is, not to mention where Russia is. Um, so it's much better to be in a crowd where actually knows where places are. Um, so anyway, yeah, see, the, the, the very famous seven bridges of Konigsberg problem is a uh, graph problem where you have to create a path between, uh, that goes through the city, and you can only cross every bridge of the seven bridges in Konigsberg once. Uh, which Euler generalized into a what became later graph theory, and this was 400 years ago. So you could say that it's one of the oldest databases, graph databases are one of the oldest technologies there are. If you look at you know, SQL databases, they're 40 years old. No SQL databases have been around for like 10 years, and graphs have been around basically forever. Um, so graph databases, specifically in this context, isn't just any database where you can put a graph, right? Because you can represent a graph in a bunch of different ways, but specifically what we want to talk about is gra uh, databases which are optimized to represent data that's highly interconnected, and they, uh, they're optimized both on the storage level, which makes it easy to store interconnected data and store the vertices and edges of a graph, and also run queries on that data, right? Both of those properties are not something you can do with a regular database most of the time. Uh, so if you think about, for example, you could represent a graph uh, with a SQL database, right? So let's say we want to build our own very Facebook, and we're going to start out with a SQL database. We have a table called users. We have a table called user friends, right? So the table of user friends has an ID of one user and an ID of the other user. And how do we find the friends of a particular user? You do a join. There wasn't a trick question. I'm not, I don't ask trick questions. I ask very easy questions so everyone can just relax. So yeah, you do a join. And if you want to find the friends of the friend, you do a uh, triple join, right? Because you, you have to join the table, then to the user table, then again to the mapping table, and then again to the user table for the third time. You can find the friend of a friend. Now, if you have a billion users and you have a trillion connections between all of them, this gets very, very difficult, and there's no way to actually practically do this with a SQL database. You need some kind of database that both has the data structures in place to perform this kind of query to actually traverse a graph, and also the basic data structures to store the information better than just better than just uh, a flat table, which you have to scan and find all the links, right? So. That's what defines a graph database, and if you look at all the graph databases there are, from the data modeling perspective, they're all very similar, right? You have uh, vertices, and each one of them can have a bunch of different properties. They have edges, which connect one vertex to another, usually directed vertexes, and each vertex can also have, uh, sorry, the edge, directed edges, and each edge can also have a bunch of different properties. And then it can perform different queries, and we'll talk about how you actually express queries in just a bit. Uh, but first, let's talk about what you would actually do with a graph like this. Obviously, uh, throw out some ideas. Social networks is obviously the first answer, and that's a trivial one, so don't say social network. Other things you can do and rep represent as a graph. If no one comes up with ideas, I'll actually tell you, obviously, but you know, it's not interesting. Genealogy. Genealogy is a good one. It's actually kind of a niche use case of a social network, but yeah, fair enough. Uh, oh, sorry? Yes, so, yep, yeah, so pretty much any, any kind of um, uh, physical relationship or hierarchy can represent as a graph, but there are more interesting things. For example, anyone uses navigational apps, uh, Google Maps, uh, Waze, whatever you have. Obviously, they don't use a graph database. They have much uh, more optimized structures, but if you were to build a very simple navigational app, uh, 
that's something you would uh, very naturally represent as a graph. You have, you have locations, you have routes, which are the edges between them. Each one has a certain cost, right, or weight on the graph, which is you know, how long it takes, for example, to traverse from point A to B. And finding the shortest or the cheapest route between all the points is actually uh, the same seven bridges of, of Konigsberg problem we go back to every time. Uh, so that would be one use case. Um, things like representing highly uh, complex hierarchies like security permissions. We'll actually have an example later of how you represent security permissions as a graph, but if you think about it, uh, just even something simple as the Windows ACL, or you know, Linux permission system, where you have users, they belong to groups, the groups can have uh, ownership of fol uh, folders which have files, so actually deciding who can touch a particular file is not a trivial question, right? If you try to do this with a relational database, you're gonna end up doing a lot of joins and it's gonna be very expensive. So this is a very na natural fit for that. Uh, things like recommendation engines, and we'll actually build a very small recommendation engine just a bit later. Uh, so finding things that people like, who also like other things, and just doing a bunch of redirection uh, skips from that, um, very natural to represent as a graph. So let's talk about what, uh, which graph databases there are. Now th this is a screenshot from a website called dbengines.com. It's a website that aggregates databases by, I guess you could say by popularity, right? It's not exactly popularity, but things like mentions on, uh, uh, open, on uh, uh, web networks, on Google Trends, on Stack Overflow, things like that, and they aggregate and build a kind of, kind of a uh, um, weighted average uh, score for every database according to popularity and usage. Uh, now this is just a snapshot of only the graph databases. Um, now for, uh, for comparison, for example, if you look at the whole list, MongoDB, everyone knows what MongoDB is? Who doesn't? <laughs> no one admits that they don't, good. Uh, so MongoDB, for example, has a score of 320. All right, so right there you can see that graph databases are in a very small niche, and in that small niche, Neo4j is a ginormous gorilla filling up most of the niche. Right, so it's a very uncomfortable niche. Um, and besides Neo4j, we have a few main players which are actually deployed in production people use. Um, the Cosmos DB, which used to be Azure Document DB before they changed it, um, suddenly came in a couple of years ago and uh, get, got in very quickly into number two. I don't actually know how many people use it in production. We'll talk about production and deployment later. Uh, but beyond that, we have OrientDB, which is not a pure graph database. It's a what's called a multi-model database. Uh, this is becoming a very strong trend lately in the database uh, industry where you take a graph which represents data a certain way and then you tack on a bunch of different ways to look at the same data. Right? So for example, uh, OrientDB started out as a document database, same as uh, CosmosDB, and then they added semantics for representing graphs and edges on top of their existing storage and added a uh, graph traversal and query engine on top of it. Right. Neo4j is probably one of the few databases here which started out as a pure graph database and remained a, few, a pure graph database. Uh, for example, just outside this wall, um, there's the RavenDB booth. Right. And I was talking to Oren earlier, and they said that they, on their roadmap, somewhere next year, they're looking at a graph database on, on top of it. So everyone wants a graph database. Uh, I work for Couchbase. I know we have graphs on the roadmap somewhere in 2019, uh, like somewhere. Right. So everyone wants some of that. Uh, but again, we're mostly going to be talking about the first three because that's the interesting stuff. And all the others are either similar or just so niche, it's not actually interesting to talk about. So one particular thing I want to point out is there are different ways to work with graphs, right? We're mostly going to be talking about databases in this case. There are a lot of graph processing frameworks. For example, Facebook, when they want to process their ginormous social networking graph where they have over a billion users and over a trillion connections between them, there is no practical way to put that in a database, even a scalable you know, uh, distributed database, there's no way to do that. So for example, they use a framework called, called Giraffe, which runs on top of Hadoop, and it does offline, very slow, but very massive processing using hundreds of machines to actually process their social networking graph, get results out, and cache them somewhere else. So that's a very interesting stuff, and you can talk about that all day as well, and, but just not in this talk. Um, all right, so we'll mostly be talking about databases, and the first thing you do when you talk about databases is how do you query your data, all right? So you put in a bunch of data. We said, yes, we store edges and vertices. They have properties. How do you get the data out, all right? Obviously, you need some kind of query language. The problem is, does everyone know SQL? SQL, yes, SQL. I was going to ask who doesn't know, but then they wouldn't know if they don't. Anyway. Um, so uh, SQL is very, this basically is the, the industry standard for querying stuff, right? So 
Uh, even NoSQL databases like CouchBase and Cassandra and a bunch of others are adding a SQL-like language because that's what everyone learns and that's what everyone speaks. Unfortunately, SQL just isn't really equipped to deal with uh, expressing a graph traversal algorithm. Right? There's no syntax that you can put on top of SQL that will make it express, you know, go and calculate these kind of nodes and do this kind of algorithm or, you know, build PageRank, which is one of the most popular algorithms on top of graphs in SQL. All right, so everyone comes up with their own language. And they usually fall into one of two groups. Either it's a language used to describe patterns on a graph and look for patterns, or it's a language that describes the actual algorithm you want to traverse in the graph and then executes it. So let's look at the first type. The first type is called Cypher. It's a language that uh, Neo4j uses. And Cypher works with patterns. Right? The way you write a Cypher query is you go to a blackboard, you draw arrows and circles on a graph of what you want to find. For example, I want to find all objects A, which have a relationship called user to object B, and then I want to return all of them. And then the way to translate that into a Cypher query is just create the ASCII art of the same graph, and that's a valid Cypher query. Uh, and then you run this and you get back a bunch of A's and B's and the links between them, right? So the way this looks, let's actually go over and to uh, Neo4j and take a look. There we go. All right, so let's load up a, this is a sample database that comes uh, very commonly with Neo4j and it's a, uh, from a uh, database of, of uh, movies, uh, actors, and uh, ratings, kind of like IMDb, but you know, for were you not actually the large IMDb? And um, this is the UI for Neo4j. Let's make it a bit larger, too large. Uh, okay, so we can actually here take a look and see what kind of objects we have in our database. So we can look here and we can have different nodes. Usually, the convention in Neo4j is that every node has a label, which is kind of what type it is. We can think of it as a class. This is a class, which is just another property that that's carried with the node on the graph or with the vertex on the graph, but it's sort of the main, main property of that node. So we can have nodes of type actor, director, movie person, and user. And we can actually go and look at all of them. And then we get some kind of pretty graph like this, and we can see that, for example, there's a movie, Avatar, and you know, there are all the people who participated in it. And we can see that the type of connection, uh, if I zoom in a bit, is this one acts in. Right? And then we can play around with the UI, double click, and explore the graph, and you can spend hours just doing this, and I've done that. <laughs> and it's fun, and you can do all kinds of weird queries on it. So for example, let's find something useful in this graph. Let's throw this away. Um, and you know, the, uh, let's talk about how you actually express ideas in Neo4j. So what we do is we run a query called the match query, which means look for a pattern. Look for a pattern on the graph. We want to find all the directors um, that have a link. Uh, called directed to any object uh, with labels movie. We don't want just any director. We want specifically one of the best directors in the world. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, I uh, mistyped something, so we're just going to do this. And then, yeah, there we go. And now we can find the graph for Mel Brooks and all the awesome movies he's ever created. We can actually, um, we can style it a little bit like this, and then just give some colors to it, excellent. And so we can see that here is Mel Brooks and all the movies he directed. So now let's say, um, what are Mel Brooks is well known for casting himself in movies. So let's see what movies there are where he is both a director and, um, uh, and all the co-actors in the movie. So how do we represent that? So what we want is, again, a pattern. We want an object called director, a particular label on it named Mel Brooks, we have, which has a link or relationship called directed to any movie. And at the same time, if you look at the other side of that graph, right, we want another link, also actors who have a relationship called acts in to that same movie. So we have two, three objects here, right? We have the director, we have the movie, and we have the co-actor. And then we return all of them and we can see, here we go, we have both Mel Brooks and all the other actors. But what if, we just, what if we, don't we, we don't want all the other actors? We just want Mel Brooks. Let's see the movies he both starred in and directed. How do we need to change the query? There's only one thing we need to change, which is this. We actually want T, right? So we want 
T being Mel Brooks, we want all the movies to which he is both connected by a directed link and an acted in link. And so if we look at this, it's now go anywhere. And now obviously you can see all the movies he both directed and acted in, which is basically all of them. So it's not really a good example, but you, know, you can see the queries. And you know, obviously it's, they're good movies, so. Um, okay, so in this database we also have uh, users, and we have a bunch of user ratings. So every user has given you know, a star rating from one to five to a bunch of movies, and we can actually go and actually and look at how many uh, stars each movie got. All right, so how would you do that? We want to find anything. It's actually going to be a user, but we don't care. So empty parenthesis, find anything which is connected by a relationship called rated to an object with label movie. And then th from this point, it turns into a more of a regular query language. We want to return the sum of the stars and order by the stars descending. So this, uh, this actually gives us not a graph, but a flat table, right? So here we have this particular movie. Uh, we don't need this, we just need a uh, title. All right, so we have the title and the number of stars, and we can look at it. And this is kind of a regular database query, except it runs on, on the graph. All right, and then uh, lastly, we can do things like uh, look for paths between different users and movies. Uh, who knows what uh, the Erdos number is? Or a Bacon number or Erdos number? There's one guy in the back. What's your Erdos number? So, so uh, Paul Erdos, is a, he's a mathematician. He's very prolific. He's known for publishing papers with basically everybody in the world. Uh, and the Erdos number is the number of links between you and the paper you published and somebody else who published a paper with someone else who someone else who published a paper with Paul Erdos. And there is the equivalent in Hollywood, which is the Kevin Bacon number, who's known for the same thing, but just acting in all the movies. So for an actor, his Bacon number is how many links are between him and Kevin Bacon, where they participate in the same movie. So Neo4j has a built-in function called shortest path. So if you find a bunch of paths, this will just give you the shortest one. And what we want is we want a person named Kevin Bacon with any, um, any number of links between them. So star means not just one link, not just one relationship, but any length of relationship to, let's say, Mel Brooks. And we'll find out Mel Brooks's Kevin Bacon number, which means what's the shortest path between Mel Brooks and Kevin Bacon. And then what we return is we want P. P is the path itself. And length of P, which is the actual uh, Bacon number. So it's, it's actually complaining that the path is unbounded, which is usually a bad idea. You don't want to scan every length of, uh, of path because it could be almost infinite, right? So we can usually uh, just limit it to, let's say, between one and 10 steps. All right, and then we can go and see that indeed uh, Mel Brooks's Kevin Bacon number is four. And we can see that the way it goes is Mel Brooks acted in Little Rascals with Rebo McIntyre, who acted in Tremor, excellent movie, by the way, uh, with Kevin Bacon. All right, so this is kind of queries you can do on a graph. And if you start thinking about how would you express this stuff with, let's say, a SQL database, you could, but it's probably not going to work in an actual uh, production use case, right? Whether you have a, a lot of data. All right, so this is the way you build queries in uh, Neo4j, and that's the Cypher language. Uh, we'll look at actual practical examples of what you can do with graph databases in just a bit, but let's go back and think of other query languages, right? So let's take a look at the query language used by um, OrinDB. Yeah, it's going to take a while. So RNDB went a different way, uh, and they um, they tried to build their query language as much on top of SQL as actually possible, right? So their queries look kind of like SQL with weird stuff in it, which relates to graphs. <laughs> um, so, for example, let's say we have the same database, we can load the same data into uh, RNDB, and I'll show you just in just a sec. Uh, and in their case, what we want, for example, is to find all the movies. Where, have, where the title is spaceable, so this part is entirely SQL-like, right? But what we want is, we don't want the actual movies, we want to find all the users who rated them highly, for example, right? We want to find all the users who actually like mo correct movies, not the wrong kind of movies. Um, and we'll build a recommendation engine on top of that in just a bit. Uh, so what we want is an expand. Expand is a new command they added to their query language, which follows a relationship 
from one object to the next. So in this case, expand would go and find an inward edge, which means a arrow pointing from user to movie, called rated, which means user, user rated, and it will only follow those relationships which have the property rating equal five, and it will find us the actual users, right? So let's actually take a look at this. Let's uh, run the actual database and do, run some queries on top of it. It's always better to show the actual database than show a slide which does the same thing. So let's take a look at RNDB. This is RNDB, same database mo called movie ratings. Um, let's connect to it and take a look. And I'm amazed things actually work. So, all right, so we can do something like this. First of all, is there to do select star from movies, uh, movies, right? And run this, and what we see is a table of the objects called movie. The schema for the object, by the way, let's look at the schema for just a moment. Is we have a base class, and again, in Orient uh, DB, it works uh, if you can think of it as a object object model, right? So you can have the base class, which is a vertex or an edge, and you have a bunch of classes which uh, inherit from that. So, for example, you have a class called movies, which inherits from a vertex because it's a node on a graph, and you have a class called uh, um, let's say rated, which inherits from an edge, so it connects two vertices, right? So if we go back to our graph, we can see that select star from movies gives us a table of uh, data. We have the movie with the title property and we have all the links which connect to that object. For example, this movie uh, object, Toy Story, has the following links coming into it, which are all the users who have rated the movie Toy Story. And now we can actually follow this link out and find who this object is, right? So this is where SQL ends and graphs begin we can actually follow a property and find the different objects into it. So let's actually find a good movie to look at. Of course, I have the thing prepared. So now we can look at, this is just movie Spaceballs, right? And these are all the users who rated it. So how do we find all the users who actually liked Spaceballs? This is the same query we had on the slide earlier. We're from movies where the title is Spaceballs, so this exact object. We're going to follow all of these links, right? So rated this guy, this guy, this guy. These are the edges, and we want to find out who the edge connects to. So the way to find out is we expand the, e the rated edge, only those who have rating of five, and then from that we go out. So from the edge we go out and we find another vertex. All right, so who are these vertexes? Um, there we go, go away. Right. So these vertices give us back a user object. You can see that it's a different object. It has properties like gender, age, occupation, zip code. So we found a different object, essentially a different table in the database, which lists users. So these are, these are the uh, wise users who enjoy Spaceballs. All right. um, so now, from these, we can start building our recommendation engine. So let's see what other movies these people also rated with five stars. Right. So presumably, someone who likes the same movies as me will uh, like other movies the same as me, right? So the next step here would be slightly, uh, slightly complicated, but what we want to do is uh, we want to expand the rating, right, from the movie Spaceballs, we start out, and we traverse the rated uh, edge, we find the user. So from the user, we want to traverse further the rated edge and find a movie, right, because the graph is cyclical. If we start with a movie, we go out to a user, from the user we can go find a different movie, correct? Because the graph goes in every direction. So if, if we actually look at it, same, in the same thing in uh, Neo4j, right? And we look at a movie, we'll find um, users, right? So a user here has a link called rated to this movie, right? So if we go, and then we, if we go from this link and find a different user, we can look at what other movies this user or this user rated and find other movies that they liked. Everyone with me? Good. So in this case, in RNDB, we're following out from our movie to a user and from that user to a different movie, which is supposedly the same or also a good movie that the person liked. And if we run this, we find a list of movies. Uh, but also we find the movie itself, obviously, so we don't want the movie itself. So let's add um, where title not like Spaceballs. 
right? Because we don't want the movie itself, we just want all the other movies. And if you look at it, these are all the movies that users who rated Spaceballs with five stars also rated with five stars. And obviously if you look at the list, it's an awesome list, it's basically all the good movies that there are. There are no other good movies. Um, and cl clearly, at least for me, this recommendation engine is working very well. And we can actually validate it very easily. Let's see what uh, movies these users rated with one star. Right? And if we look, change that, so all the users who like Spaceballs, let's find the movies that they hate and see if this is a list of movies to avoid. And then we find wonderful gems like Spice World, the Spice Girls movie. Um, and uh, Battlefield Earth, which is so bad it's famous. And other things like Home Alone 3. So clearly the recommendation engine is working really well. All right, so there we go, done, right? We can ship it. Um, okay, so as you can see, this, this is, it's actually a very easy graph traversal, right? We're only going three steps. We start with the movie, we do a little filtering, we don't traverse all the edges out from it, just particular edges, find a user, and from there we go and find other movies. All right, so this is a nice query language, and um, as you can see, they try to be as SQL-ish as possible, so you can recognize a lot of the things here, select this and that from something, and the only interesting part here, of course, is the actual graph expansion, which instead of selecting from this table, you end up selecting from a different table which is linked to it. So th this part you can actually possibly replace with the join and you'll be more or less SQL-ish. Right. So in this case, uh, there is yet a third way to query graphs. And the third way is using a generic language called Gremlin. Now Gremlin is the language of Apache Tinkerpop, uh, which is a project which uh, provides a graph query framework. And it can run basically on any graph database, or actually, in fact, any, gra any database at all. We actually have an engineer at Couchbase who built a, an implementation of Gremlin on top of Couchbase. It's not as performant because if, if internally it still does key value lookups, but you can still run the query just slowly, right? And the way Gremlin expresses it is very natively close to how the traversal algorithm itself works, right? You explicitly tell it where to start on the graph, how to traverse to the next node, how to find the next node you want, which nodes to go to and what operations to perform on the way, right? So Gremlin looks like this, you start with a graph, G is the graph object, and you pick a particular vertex because you have to start a traversal somewhere, you can't just start traversing from everywhere in the graph. And starting out from that vertex, which is you know, the first user, you follow an edge out, for example, a relationship called friend of the user, you follow a vertex in and you find another user object, presumably, and you print his name and that's you know, the friend of the user. And if you do this again, you'll find the friend of a friend. And that's the way you express that in Gremlin. And the cool part is, if you write in Gremlin, you can change the underlying data structure or the underlying database even without changing your query, because you can run the query uh, on Neo4j, and at the same time, you can run a Gremlin query on OrianDB. In fact, let's, let's show it. So Gremlin is a console, uh, console application, and you can connect it both to, uh, pretty much to any graph database. All right, so let's take a look here. Let's go to my Gremlin console. All right, so we'll start with the OrientDB example. So we're on the Gremlin console, and here we, ha we can actually connect to it first. All right, so it logs into the same movie database we had earlier with the UI, but this time we're doing it from the Gremlin console. Uh, the, the language itself is Groovy, in, in case you're, you're familiar with Groovy, it's a very nice scripting language. Um, and now we can start doing things like, okay, well, let's find spaceballs here. I'm gonna be uh, copy-pasting because I don't wanna make typos. So I happen to know that the ID is this, and we can go and find, you know what, let's actually move this slightly here, so we can, is this better? Go. All right, so we can find the object and the map print out, uh, prints out all the properties. So we can find space balls, right? And we can do the same query we had earlier, right? Let's see who rated it highly, right? Which is this query. So we can start, we know that this is space balls, right? So we can start with this vertex, uh, with, uh, then we follow the rated edge out, and we filter it, only those who have rating equals five, and then we follow from that rating outwards towards the vertex and we find another vertex which happens to be a user. And we can see that indeed we find a user and a bunch of user objects. And then we can go and basically recreate the same query we had earlier just with Gremlin, right? 
Now, can, from the user, can go and find all the actual movies they rated. I probably shouldn't have run that. Um, and then we can skip a couple of steps and get to the final query, which I'll show in just a moment. And basically what it does is exactly the same thing, right? And we can now actually learn, we, can, we now learned how to read a graph query. So let's, see, uh, let's try it again. We start out with spaceballs. We follow the rating out to all the users who rated it with five. We follow from that user to all the other movies which they rated five. We filter it. We don't want anyone titled Spaceballs, so we filter out the one movie that uh, we know is going to be there. Then we group it by title, right? And then we count how many there are. And we sort it in a descending order, uh, sorry, ascending order, and then we get the results, which is titles of movies and how many users have rated it, right? So we can actually you know, do things like uh, instead of counting, we can do an average rating, for example. Same thing as here. So uh, here, instead of count, we can do average. All right, and then we get the average rating. Um, all right, so as you can see, this query runs and does exactly the same thing as the Orient DB native query. Uh, now, performance-wise, it's not the same, right? Because obviously, internally, there's some kind of mechanism which translates the Gremlin query to a series of steps which will run on Orient DB. And depending on the implementation, it can be better or worse Depends, depending whether the query you can create, for example, in Cypher for NeoFJ or in the Orient DB query language, if that query is efficient or if actually explicitly uh, defining the steps of the traversal, if that ends up being more efficient. Usually, the native query wins. That's from my experience. All right, so let's do the same thing for Neo4j, right? We can do exactly the same thing. We can go to a uh, Neo4j uh, gremlin, and then we can run basically all the same queries. We'll get to something more interesting than that in just a moment. Don't, don't worry. And basically, yeah, we connect to, uh, to a Neo4j, and then we can do you know, all the same queries. Let's say, you know, find all the, let's say, this happens to be Mel Brooks. I know the ID is, so I just wanted to shorten it. Let's find out all the movies the Mel Brooks directed, and let's see all the people who act in those movies, and then we can ca group them by name, order them, and then count them, right? And so we can find the top five people who Mel Brooks casts in his movies, and obviously himself being the first one, right? All right, so as you can see, we can do the same kind of query. We can write it once in Gremlin. Then we can run it on a bunch of different databases. For example, we can run it in the same way on Cosmos DB. Now, Cosmos DB, as I said, the Azure database, I've been, uh, I'm not sure if it's actually going to work because uh, the internet connection here is kind of iffy. Uh, but this started out as the document database for Azure. Actually started out as uh, Microsoft trying to build their own version of a NoSQL database. And then they shifted and decided that it's going to be only cloud native. So they added kind of a competitor to DynamoDB on Amazon. And then they decided they're going to slap a bunch of different APIs on top of it. So since it's going to be key value, they have a MongoDB API on top of it, and a SQL API on top of it, and a Graph API on top of it. But internally, it works pretty much like you would expect uh, a Graph API to work. So you, you have a bunch of, uh, in the graph, in Azure, you have a bunch of nodes and edges, and you can define them. And the cool part is you, it also provides Gremlin bindings. So you can run from a Gremlin console like this. You can connect to your uh, document DB on Azure and run Gremlin queries. And then if you want to move this data to a different database, for example, or DB or Neo4j, you can do that, and you don't have to change the queries. So if we run the... Kremlin equivalent here. Let's see if it connects because, as I said, internet is kind of iffy here. But if it does connect, we might be able to run a query. There we go. Um, not this. Just, you know. Just a simple query. So this query is take the graph, take all the vertices. Find one which has a label person and equal a first name equals Thomas. Find out a uh, follow out a vert an edge called knows someone. Find the vertex that it connects to, which is probably another person, and also has a label person, and print out its first name. So we can say that Thomas has a relationship called knows with Mary and Robin, right? So as I said, same same API, same kind of query language. We just ran it on three different databases on CosmosDB, on OrianDB, 
And on Neo4j, you notice that a lot of database companies like to call their databases something DB, like half of them at least, um, like RavenDB. Couchbase is the exception to that rule. It's not Couchbase DB, it's just Couchbase. So anyway, moving on. Um, so before we get to this, let's talk about what you can actually do with graph databases, right? And we have a couple of examples. We'll see how many I can show you because there's a bunch of really cool things you can show. But obviously, the, the thing you can spend most of your time looking at is the movie database because you can do really interesting queries in there. But let's look at some practical stuff. So first, we're going to look at what I said earlier, which is how do you express a permission system on top of a graph, right? And this is an actual it's an example I stole from a real-world uh, company. I worked as a consultant with... Um, a large company which should remain nameless, and they moved from a SQL database to Couchbase. The reason they did that is because they serve content and they have a very complicated security permission system on their content. So for every content, they have owners and uh, groups which owners belong to and other organizations which those groups can belong to, and every one of them can either see the content or not see the content or change it or change certain permissions on it. So it's a ginormous uh, graph with something like 12 levels of different hierarchies just to find out if you can serve you know, a small document to someone and show it to them. And as soon as you start talking about things like scanning and doing a search, it becomes even more complicated because for every item in the search you have to change and you have to check all the permissions in the list, right? And so they had this running on SQL for quite a while and then they decided that SQL was probably a bad idea uh, because uh, it was uh, bringing their, their database to a halt and they looked for something faster and they ended up implementing it, essentially brute forcing the problem with Couchbase, which isn't necessarily the right solution. Obviously I work with Couchbase so I didn't tell them that. Um, but um, it's not necessarily the right solution because it's very fast so they can do a bunch of queries very quickly and do, this, do the equivalent of a graph traversal just by doing a bunch of key value gets, right? But um, if they were to implement this as a permission system, it would look something like this. So we would have something like a, uh, let's say, file, group, role, and user. So we have a very simple uh, data set here. Let's take a look at it. Right, um, like this. Right, and we have, let's say we have four documents, doc one, two, three, and four, and we have four users. We have David, Arthur, John, and Lior here. Right, and the user can either have direct permissions on a particular document, or they can belong to a uh, group, and the group can have permissions on a document. Or they can have a role, right, a database role, and the role can have permissions on documents. Or the group can have a role, right? So you have a bunch of different inter interconnected rules, and if you try to represent this in SQL, you can, but same issue we had earlier, right? You're gonna run into a bunch of joints that are gonna be very inefficient. So here, how would you, for example, find uh, who has permissions to view document two, right? So in this case, it's actually pretty simple. Let's hope, hope I can actually type it correctly. Uh, otherwise, I'll just copy and paste. But let's say we want uh, to match any thing, uh, user, let's say, user, which has any kind of relationship to a file named uh, doc2.txt, right? Uh, like this, sorry. Right, and so, oh, and we want to actually return them, of course. Right, so in this case, we can find there's two users directly connected to the file. But it's not, that's not good enough, we don't want that. Uh, we want, uh, something better. We want to know who actually is allowed to see the file. Uh, so let's look at a slightly more complicated query, um, which would give us all the users, right? So in this case, yes, we now find all the different links that connect to that user, right? Because we look at all the uh, all the links, all the relationships, but it's, again, that's still not good enough because some of them are, can allow and some of them, of them can deny. So for example, John in this case shouldn't actually see document two because he has a direct deny relationship with the file, right? So we should exclude John from this. So what we want to do is we want only users who have allow, right? So we can complicate the query and we say, we give us all the users who has either a member of or has belonging to a role or allow relationship 
which terminates with an allow relationship to the file. So only, only those who actually are allowed to see it. Unfortunately, that still doesn't solve the problem because uh, some of them have both allow and deny pointing at the file. So for example, John here is a member of the build stuff group, which has an allow permission document too, but at the same time he has a deny link to document two. At this point it becomes a business decision, right? Do you allow him to see the file or not, right? So this, this is out of our hands, but let's say it's a very strict organization, and if there is a deny relationship, you shouldn't show the file, right? So you need to further complicate the query and say, okay, all of that, except if you have a deny relationship. So in this case, it's easier to express, give me all the links except those which have deny, right? So what we want to do is, as we had earlier, give me all the possible relationships between user and document two, where not, and you can actually, in Cypher, this is a valid query, where they don't uh, have this particular match, which means something which, has, which terminates with a deny link towards file two, right? And if we land this, this should actually exclude John uh, from our list, and indeed we can see that only three users show up and those guys can in fact go and see doc2 and all of them have either direct allow or some kind of link which allows them to see the file, right? And at this point you can complicate it as much as you want and the main, uh, main um, point here is this is very fast, right? And whether you have a million users or you know, 20, it doesn't matter, it's going to be more or less the same level of uh, performance. Uh, mostly because uh, in your 4 j as long as your data set fits in memory, is going to perform the traversal in memory very quickly. We'll get into scaling and you know, hitting disk in just a bit. All right, so let's take a look at another example, which is um, slightly more interesting. Um, so there's a game, which I, I, I play a lot of games. I play uh, video games, that's basically all I do when I don't have, you know, when I do family time. And there's a game called Path of Exile. Anyone play Path of Exile? There's like three people. Very nice. All right, good job. We'll, we'll talk later. Uh, so in Path of Exile, there is a very complicated player-driven economy. And as you know, games are very serious business, and uh, I like, what I like to do in video games is win. And the way you win in Path of Exile is just be the richest guy. Like, you have the most money. The problem is, there's no money in Path of Exile. What there is, though, is a bunch of objects which players trade. So you can have, you know, a blue, uh, blue circle, which you can trade someone else for two orange squares, and you can trade two orange squares for three uh, pink diamonds, and if you want to be the richest guy, you just need to accumulate a lot of those objects, right? The problem is, there is no in-game way to do that. So uh, there is actually a public API, which connects to the forum, which you can scrape, and see all the things player offer for sale. All right, so if I want to get a bunch of blue orbs, and by the way, it looks like this. Let's see if it actually works here. Um, so yeah, so you go to a uh, website which connects to their public API, and you say, I want to find blue orbs, and I have yellow orbs for sale, and you search, and you end up with a list of a bunch of players saying, okay, I'll trade 10 of these for 100 of those. Right, now, this looks silly, right? And yes, I, I'm very rich in game, but not in actual world. Um, <coughs> but it's actually isomorphic to a bunch of different problems. For example, uh, consider how many cryptocurrencies there are. Right, so you have Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then there's like a million different other currencies. Every celebrity has their own cryptocurrency now. Uh, and there is an exchange rate between every currency. Not just for real money, but, but you can go and trade you know, one, bin, one Bitcoin for 20 Ethereum coins, or one million Doge coins, or you know, whatever, whatever Kim Kardashian has. Um, and there is an exchange rate, and not, it's not always m uh, profitable to trade one thing directly for another. Because there's usually a route of multiple trades you can take, which you'll end up with more of the thing you actually want. So I could go to this guy and say, okay, I'll trade 10 of my yellow orbs for 150 of your blue orbs, or I can go find a different guy who offers a different kind of orb, trade to him, then a third guy who trades those orbs for the blue orbs, and maybe I'll end up with 160 orbs in the end, right? And so you can, if you, you can see how this can be represented as a graph. So let's actually take a look. And I'm not going to show you the actual application because it's very, uh, it doesn't look very good. So I just took a snapshot from uh, what my script generates. Um, and what it does is there's only something like 40 types of currency. But at any given moment, there's possibly up to a million different links between every one of them. So up to a million offers, I will trade you A for B, right, or C for D. Right? So the graph looks like this, but there's a million arrows between every item. 
right? So because you have you know a limited number of actual items, but uh, unlimited number of offers at any given moment. And what we want is we want to find the path between two objects, for example, this red one and this uh, blue one, that gives us the most blue ones at the end, right? So if we, for example, if you look here, you can trade one of those uh, exalted orbs, the pink ones, for 901 of the blue ones. But if you go through a different path, you'll end up with more of them. So how do you actually find those? Uh, that's, that becomes a very simple query in, um, in Neo4j. So first of all, let's find all the possible relationships, all the possible paths, which can be expressed as going from an exalted orb, any number of steps, and hitting an alteration orb. There's only a few of those in theory, but because we have a million links, it could be you know, a combinatorial explosion of different options. So in this case, these are all the paths. So you can take a path through any one of them. So now how do we find the best one? All we have to do is add to this query a reduce function. So we're going to go over all the uh, values on every link, multiply by one by the other. Right? So you can either have the exact number, so 900, or you can go here and get 340 of them, multiplied by 1.5, and get you know, 500 alteration orbs at the end. So this is clearly not profitable. But we can go and calculate and actually just order in descending order and find out what's the best ratio we can get. Now, if we do that, we'll see that the best number of orbs we can get is not 900, as we do in a direct trade. We'll actually get 1,173.8 uh, of those orbs. If we first go to this guy and trade him for um, 89 chaos orbs, then we go to a second guy and trade him for at the ratio of 13 to 1 to alteration orbs, right? And we can go and look at a bunch of them. And if we create a new link, let's say uh, the scraper is running in the background and a new guy shows up and offers something else for trade. I don't feel like typing it, so I'll just copy paste. So now we'll create a new edge. And some, let's say someone is offering alchemy orbs, which isn't one of the two we were talking about. It's a different kind of orb, right? So there's a new trade. Uh, that, so it creates a bunch of different routes that didn't exist before, which, which we can go through. And now if you run the same query again, we'll see that the most efficient route goes through more users, right? We can go to this guy and trade him for chaos orbs, and then trade the chaos orbs for alchemy orbs, then trade the alchemy orbs for more alteration orbs, right? And in the end, we'll get 1,600 of those. So clearly, we win the whole game, obviously. <laughs> That's exactly how. If only I could, there was a way to exchange this for actual money, I'd be really, well, not really rich, but have a bit more money. <laughs> right, so question in the back there. Excellent question. Yes, so what, what happens if we take the next step? If we find the guy who will trade blue alteration orbs back to the ones we started with, we'll end up go all the way back and just have more money. Of, with the thing we started. And yes, you can have a circle. Obviously, if you're asking, is there going to be an infinite recursion, then the database is smart enough not to traverse the same uh, path twice. Uh, but yeah, if we just add another step to this query, we could just multiply our own currency repeatedly. So let's say I start with one Bitcoin, and I trade it to a bunch of different currencies and end up with 1.1 Bitcoins. And do the cycle again and you know, end up with 1.3 Bitcoins. Or you can, you, know, you can just extend the metaphor to any system which is a complicated barter system where you can exchange one thing for another or build you know, what's the most efficient part. But also there's, a, there's another dimension here to consider which is the time dimension, right? So maybe doing a single trade is fast and doing 20 different trades is very slow. So you're, you're gonna end up getting more money but you'll spend more time getting the more money, right? So there's, uh, it's not as straightforward as, you, as, as it appears. All right. So before we finish, and I think we have like five minutes left, I want to show you something that's entirely different from graph databases, right? So far we've actually been talking about, we have an, a known number of nodes and, and, uh, and uh, relationships. We put them in a graph and then we query them. But then the question is, what if, have, what if we have a data set and we don't necessarily know all the relationships? What if we want to discover them? So this, there's a cool thing in Elasticsearch. How many people know of Elasticsearch or use Elasticsearch? All right, so Elasticsearch has a new feature since version five called Graph API, where you dump a bunch of text into Elasticsearch 
and it will use the text and uh, analyze the text and create nodes out of all the word tokens in the text. And the links are, uh, rather the edges, are calculated from uh, words occurring together. So for example, if the word A and B appear in the same document, there is a link with the weight one because they appeared once in the same document. And so from there, you can extrapolate a graph which didn't, ex which didn't, didn't exist before and build a graph, and then you can analyze it. So how does it work? Uh, we have a very simple uh, application which just scrolls Twitter and brings in a bunch of tweets. It's actually very hard to find keywords which generate a lot of tweets for demos. Uh, so I'm forced to go with things like this because there's just a lot of tweets there. I, try, uh, I swear, I tried build stuff and build stuff and you, just got, you guys don't tweet enough, right? So this gives me like one tweet an hour and this gives me way too many tweets. Uh, also, I urge you not, I'm gonna run this. Please don't read the tweets. On, people on the internet are just terrible people. Just, just believe me that tweets are, are coming, right? So let's run this and get a few of those coming in. Hopefully the internet actually holds. And what we're gonna do is, with those tweets, which will be coming in a second now, there we go. Uh, what happens is, every time I get a tweet, I take the text, I do some very simple sentiment analysis on it. Uh, there's an open source library called the Stanford Natural Language Processing Library, which can take a bunch of text and spit out a integer between zero and four, zero being very negative sentiment, four being very positive sentiment. It's not super accurate, but for large statistics, it's actually very convenient to use. Uh, so now let's take a look at some of the tweets coming in, right? So we'll go over here to Kibana, which is the UI for Elasticsearch. We can actually see, uh, there we go, tw tweets are coming in. We can look at one of the tweets and see the data, right? So um, something like this, we have the text, we have the hashtags and all that, but we don't care about that. We actually want to go to a graph. And what this does is it starts out with some kind of seed, so let's say a word, and then it builds out a graph of related words from that seed. So what we can do is we can start out with, um, let's say we'll go with just text, uh, user, and hashtags. So there are different fields all within the same object, all within the same document, right? So because they exist in the same document, they have an, we consider them to be linked. Right, so let's take a look. Obviously we have to go with something we know exists there, so let's go with. And then we can find a bunch of links in the database. And as you can see, uh, the A is a word or a text in the body of the tweet. This is a username and that's a hashtag. And we can start seeing uh, some related, uh, some relations between all of them. So we can start expanding the graph and building around and then at some point we'll see clusters. So for example, a lot of these uh, these tweets and hashtags are clearly related. So things like finance, related to uh, money, related to economy. Naturally, a lot of those words will occur together in different tweets. All right, we can go, uh, we'll see that breaking and news are in the same cluster. Makes sense, a lot of those are in the same, uh, in the same category. Uh, if we go somewhere else, you know what, let's load one of my existing uh, graphs. This one actually t also shows the sentiment uh, dimension. So we can see that um, here we have the negative sentiment and there's a big cluster of users around that. We can go and find the positive sentiment over here and there's a, obviously a much smaller uh, cluster of users around that. Um, so for example, if we go and look for Trump in this case, right, and then expand it, we'll see that uh, can't quite see him, but I'm almost certain he's in this cluster somewhere, right? Um, so generally speaking, you can look at uh, things like this and uh, decide that yes, there's a, um, there's a strong correlation, for example, between negative sentiment and all of these. Now if we can actually, uh, we can add words to that, so we can add the actual text, because we're not looking at text here yet. Um, sorry, let's see, yeah, text. I'm gonna start looking at the kind of words which appear in relation to the same cluster. Right, so now we can take all of this data, which is a graph that we didn't have before. That we, we, it emerged from the actual text we had, right? We found words which were correlated in the same tweet, and from that we can build a graph, and the strength of, uh, we don't only have the vertices and the edges, we also have at least weight on every edge, because we can look at it and see that, for example, um, 
I don't know where he is. Somewhere around here. Doesn't matter. Let's pick any of them. Um, so, for example, the word complete sports is strongly correlated with the username complete sports. Makes sense, right? And we can see that all of the tweets which have one word, 100% of them had the other word. And uh, if we look at something like, let's uh, look at some other strong correlations. So, for example, this guy is strongly correlated with negative sentiment. So, of the 158 tweets that this username posted, 126 had a negative uh, uh, sentiment. We can start to drill down into this particular user and we'll, for example, see the kind of words that he's associated with. So, you can see that this user we're looking at uh, is using words like Mitch, McConnell, committee. So, yeah, so he tweets about a politics a lot. Makes sense that he'd be very strongly con correlated to negative sentiment. Um, all right, so now we can lift all of this out. We can put it in an actual graph database and we can run graph queries on all this data because we took just a bunch of text, we turned it into a graph. All right, so I'm one minute over time and I'm happy to answer some questions uh, and then uh, I think we're done with the conference. Any questions? Yes? Performance is a good question, yes. So most of the performance in graph databases in general hinges on one thing. Um, how do you scale performance? There's only two ways, right? You can scale up, which is a bigger machine, it makes sense, right? And then you can scale out. The problem is graphs don't uh, shard very well. Sharding graph or graph partitioning is an, uh, usually an NP hard problem. Remember graph complexity, uh, sorry, algorithm complexity? So most graph partitioning algorithms fall strongly into the NP hard uh, domain, which means it's very hard to actually compute them. And practical solutions to graph partitioning are usually approximations and they relate to statistics. So for example, the way Neo4j handles that is they don't partition graphs. They create replicas of the graph on multiple machines and then they do smart query routing so that every machine will have different nodes cached in memory. So a particular query will always go to a particular machine and that will force some of the data to, to go into cache and this query will run a little faster. But it's all based on statistics and heuristics they use internally and they don't try, try to actually solve the partitioning problem itself because it's very hard. Um, so in terms of performance, uh, usually if you can do the traversal as much as, as possible in memory, is going to perform well. As soon as you hit either an inter-process communication or the network or the disk, performance tanks, and the more complex the query, the more times you will hit the disk and performance is gonna go down. Um, this brings us actually to polyglot storage, which is you don't have to put all of your data into a graph database. It's very common to have a lot, most of the data in a different database, and just the stuff related to a graph uh, outsourced to a proper graph database to do that there. So in that example I had earlier, uh, you have a whole system running, for example, on Couchbase, you would outsource just a permission system to a Neo4j, hit that, and then do the rest of your stuff on the regular database instead. Anyone else? Yes? Are there any desired properties for a graph which you can take advantage of in terms of performance? Yeah. Yeah. Performance. Yeah. Yes, but it's a very complicated answer. Sorry, let's, let's talk about it later because it's, it's, it's a big topic. Um, all right, anyone else? No one's, oh, there we go. Why didn't you try uh, the Bitcoin thing? <laughs> who, says I did, who says I didn't? <laughs> Maybe, well, that's a fair point. I, I'm rich in other things like family and, uh, you know, <laughs> honor and, you know. Um, all right, anyone else? Yes. Sorry? Right. Well, every query language has semantics for a saving, but the thing is, before you can, for example, create an edge, you need to find the two things you're going to be linking, right? So usually it's the update syntax is find these two objects and then create a link with these properties on it. It's usually, you know, it's a SQL-like, right? So update graphs where A and B are objects, create link, blah. So it's just on the syntax level, it's not different from a normal database in this case. Yeah. Depends on the graph database. For example, in Neo4j, you don't have to define anything. You can just start dumping objects into it and creating uh, edges. Uh, OrientDB is much more schema-full. You actually have to create a class 
which inherits from either an edge or a vertex, you, can, you have to define at least a few properties on it, or you know, the type of the class, and then you can start putting data into it. And then at the minimum, you have to actually create both vertices and edges before you can actually run meaningful queries. Right. All right, so I think we're done. Thank you very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it.